Welcome to week four. This week we're talking about something that is likely very familiar to you, either because of what you do in the facility you work in, or simply because we're all consumers, we're all label readers in some way, and some days better than others. Uh, this week we're talking about misbranding, and really focusing on labels and the concept of labeling. That's going to involve three basic components. We're going to look at the required labeling, which is here on the left of the screen. And that's things like principal display panel, what should go there, information panel, what should go there, following all of those key requirements. We're going to look at the concept of labeling, which is represented by the social media icons. It can be other things, but that's a common one these days, is to say it's something that you put up on YouTube, considered labeling under the acts, and how so, <clears throat> particularly looking at Cordell and the limitations of Cordell, which are very important to start talking about. We're also going to briefly touch on a constitutional question about First Amendment rights, in particular when we have a truthful and accurate claim, what are sort of the issues there. We're not going to get into too many constitutional questions here, like compelled speech, even though those are in the textbook. The main one will be this commercial speech doctrine. The overarching idea of misbranding is to protect the consumers from economic harm by having a false or misleading uh, label, something that induces you to buy it. Uh, even though it maybe is inaccurate. It's good for your health when actually it's really terrible. Um, and there's differing degrees of that. You know, we can agree or disagree with whether that's right. It's very subjective. I've concluded some quotes here from uh, case law in 1993. I think it is interesting to look at what we mean by false or misleading, how low the bar is, and uh, how, in a way, the courts really don't have high esteem for what the consumers are capable of understanding and in what we should be aiming for. It's, a, it's an interesting aspect of the false and misleading case law. So our key questions for this week is number one, to recognize that there is a difference in importing a product than selling a product domestically. That's really important when we're talking about the required elements of a label. It's the most often time that we will see those actually enforced uh, if your fact panel isn't correct. If your principal display panel is wrong, you're using dual languages and not following the requirements there. Otherwise, it's not too often that we see the required elements of the labeling enforced. Maybe during an inspection, uh, an inspector might raise that issue with you, but it's not very common. The other element that we're going to be talking about is the sequence of analysis, and I'm very much a stickler for that sequence, as you know. And here, if we're talking about something that may be labeling, really stopping to do that Cordell analysis and then getting into the false and misleading analysis that we'll talk about in the discussion in the audio lecture. The other point that's worth emphasizing before jumping into the audio lecture is to remember, as always, the FDA and USDA march to different beats. They do their own thing. And whether that's good or bad, we can always debate. But the USDA takes a very proactive model. The labels themselves, the required labels, are looked at before going on to the market. That does not happen on the FDA side, and these labels are increasingly crowded with information. So we're, we're not knowing if they're misbranded until there's actually an enforcement action. And that, of course, can have ramifications. So we'll talk about all of this in the audio lecture, and I'll join you there.